Okay, good morning, everybody. Glad to see so many up here, up here despite the party. So to, this morning, we have Brendan Constantine doing a talk on deep learning on Java. Give me a hand. Thank you, Martin. Um, and uh, welcome all to this session uh, on deep learning on Java. My name is Brendan Constantine. Uh, as Martin mentioned, I'm um, a Java developer, and uh, I have a background in computer science and machine learning. Um, for a couple of years, I worked uh, in, uh, in data analysis, doing um, machine learning for an ad tech startup. Uh, we were trying to predict which ads to show to which people, and um, that's sort of how uh, I got my start. Um, but I've been always, always been interested in machine learning for quite some time to help us kind of understand um, uh, what makes us tick, and uh, how we can improve. Um, so uh, that's one of the things that I, I'm very passionate about. I like to think about uh, speech recognition, human-computer interaction, and um, how we can use these tools to uh, help us become more productive. Um, I enjoy uh, writing code. Um, I've written some tools for speech recognition and uh, language learning. And I like traveling and reading. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, I'm available online on Twitter. Um, I have a website, and uh, you can always email me. Um, OK, so uh, I thought I'd just get us started thinking about um, what, uh, what machine learning is. And in order to do that, um, we have to kind of try to, it, it's very difficult. We have to try to throw away a lot of our, uh, our, our knowledge that we know about the world. Um, and uh, for many years, we kind of struggled with how to represent um, real world objects, how to encode them, and teach them to machines. Um, well, uh, we thought for uh, quite some time that it would be uh, very easy. We'd just kind of encode all these rules that we know and teach this to a machine. Maybe someone would write them in, uh, in as uh, a, a bunch of decision rules and uh, manually do this. So just a very, very simple question. Uh, what is three? What is this concept? So we have threes come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Um, we see them all over the place, whether they're uh, three combinations of, of molecular elements. Uh, we have um, symbols, abstract symbols. We have um, like knots and different shapes and patterns. Um, and this is, this is kind of a very uh, deceivingly simple uh, question. So um, if we want to, traditionally what we do is, well, we'd, we'd take some measurement of threes and we try to uh, encode this in, in some, some set of rules that's um, uh, it, it's, it's sort of based, it's empirically based on lots of different evidence, and then we, we come up with these rules, what threes look like, um, and uh, we teach this to a machine somehow. Maybe there's, there's some hard-coded rules, but the, this is very tricky to do. Um, so another, another question is, what is a dog? Uh, a dog is, there's lots of different types of dogs that come in all different um, colors, and they may be um, running or walking, um, but we have this concept, and, and the, the dog is, in, in a sense, um, a real thing, but it's also a conceptual um, idea, that it's an, it's an object. We, we have lots of different examples, but what we try to do is try to measure these characteristics of the dog, um, and sometimes it would work <laughs> if the dog was pretty close to what we have in what we taught the machine. Um, it has very standard uh, shape and size, the ears and the eyes all come in a pretty common orientation. Um, but if they're not, uh, the, the picture or the representation isn't in the exact format that we taught it, it can be very difficult to, uh, to recognize these objects. Um, so it, going a little more abstract, uh, what is the Swedish? Well, in Sweden, you have lots of different things, right? You have Stroma, you have uh, Swedish meatballs, you have Volvo, you have Avicii. You have lots of different things that you might say are Swedish. Well, you could say, if you're, if you're programming this, you might say, well, if the picture has a geotag and it's somewhere in Sweden, then maybe it's Swedish. And then maybe if um, uh, it has the same uh, collection of words inside the image, then this is probably Swedish. Um, but uh, there's lots of different edge cases, and you can imagine where uh, it would be very easy to uh, teach it a set of rules, but these rules um, would fail in a lot of different cases. Um, so for speech recognition particularly, um, this is something I have a little bit of experience in. 
Um, this, the way, this was the way this was done for many, many years. Um, in the uh, 80s and 90s, they had um, some simple speech recognition systems that worked um, well enough. Uh, you could have uh, some Dragon dictation application on your, your desktop that would recognize simple keywords and phrases. Um, and you could use uh, open source tools like Samu Sphinx to, um, to use like a pre-trained uh, pre dictionary uh, of words. And these words were composed of phonemes uh, and syllables. And we have to teach this to the machine in, in, for every single language that we want to recognize. And um, this was a lot of hand engineering. So we have to filter out the noise. We have to look for certain uh, frequency bands that the human voice falls into. And um, this, is, this is a very brittle process. So this pipeline for uh, speech recognition um, traditionally was, was, uh, was, was very prone to, to errors. Um, so the, the overall world, word error rate um, for kind of state-of-the-art machine for speech recognition in uh, the, the 90s and even to the, the uh, 2000, 2010 was um, still very poor. So maybe one in four words were recognized incorrectly. Um, so it's, the research sort of stagnated for a little while. Um, and uh, it actually got worse at some point. Um, but uh, more recently, we've seen uh, dramatic and um, uh, increasingly uh, accurate um, improvements in word recognition error. So uh, you have speech recognition today that surpasses um, professional speech uh, interpreters. So it's people who are listening to the UN proceedings are typing them down um, in real time. Uh, for for real-time human speech transcription, um, there, the, the, the state of the art has, has pretty much surpassed that. Um, so um, you have to be 95, 98% accurate to, to get one of these jobs. And machines are already replacing um, professional uh, interpreters, uh, speech interpreters, transcri transcribers. So how did we get to that point? Um, we have uh, some ideas of why the, this has gotten better recently. Um, and this is mainly attributed to three reasons. Um, you have lots more data. So the data uh, is, is measured in terabytes and exabytes these days. And, we have, and this, this primarily um, gives us many more uh, examples to, to learn from, and we can build models that generalize much, much better. Um, the second thing is, is probably uh, faster hardware. So in, in some sense, we have... Um, uh, lots more processing capabilities, even um, on, on our own personal devices, than uh, some of the, the largest mainframes had um, many years ago. But even, even these two things really aren't enough. Um, so we've made some very good progress in, in algorithms um, and how to approach these problems um, so that uh, the models that we learn, the things that we teach the machines, are, are, uh, are, are, much, uh, are much more robust. Um, so what can we do with machine learning? Uh, what does it get, get us? It gets us several things. Um, we traditionally break it down into a few categories, but it's good at prediction, so predicting the future. Um, maybe if, if you take uh, a series of, of a time series uh, data set, it might be able to predict something um, on uh, a, a periodic basis, so a seasonal increase or, or change in uh, demand for a product or something like this. Um, we have uh, the idea that it can detect anomalies or, or errors very well. Um, so uh, these might not be something that's um, somewhere off in the distance. So th this might be something that's in the center of your data set. Um, and we might, it has some unusual characteristics. So for fraud detection and things like this, this is a, a very uh, good application for machine learning. Um, and then you see it used a lot uh, for personalization, for customization of your search results. Um, when you're shopping, things that are um, similar to your likes and interests, uh, you can uh, receive much more personal uh, results. So th this is something that um, has to do with an area of machine learning known uh, as co collaborative filtering or um, recommendation. Um, and uh, two d new, new areas that are kind of being explored, but we still haven't gotten a good understanding of, is using AI to not just predict or categorize objects in the world, but to control uh, systems. So 
Um, th this, is, this is used uh, in lots of different areas, but um, robotics, for example, uh, gameplay, uh, exploitation in, in sort of maybe the stock market type scenario, or uh, advertising where you have uh, some uh, set of choices that you can take and a reward for each choice, uh, and this may change over time, and you want to learn uh, the set of uh, choices to take um, that maximizes your, your cumulative reward. Um, this is an area of machine learning known as reinforcement learning. Um, but from, uh, what I'd like to think about it sort of from a little bit of a different perspective, um, and how, we can, uh, how, how can we use machine learning uh, to improve our own uh, capabilities? So um, I think one very interesting area is education. So we have this curriculum in a lot of uh, schools that is very standardized, and you have to teach kind of to the test. So there's lots of um, different uh, benefits and disadvantages of this, this technique, but um, we can use machine learning to uh, improve, I think, early childhood education, uh, to give students um, a more customized curriculum, uh, give them feedback in different areas, um, create new types of uh, learning content. Um, there's lots of uh, different um, applications, I think, in this field, and I think you'll start to see it used more often. Um, we have uh, like parts of speech tagging if you're learning a new language, where um, you can uh, very accurately tag like subjects and verbs, and um, using this, uh, you can um, uh, so sort of teach uh, sentence structure and grammar and things like this. Um, very often when you're learning a new language, you have lots of vocabulary words, and um, if you can use uh, someone's existing vocabulary to teach them uh, a new set of vocabulary, um, so for example, if you have a word in a sentence that's kind of complicated, well maybe you can kind of replace that with a set of similar words um, that are more simple. Um, so for example, if you see like simple English Wikipedia, they have very complex um, subjects explained in simple English, which is kind of an interesting area, and you can use machine learning for this as well. Um, another area is content generation. Uh, so right now, it's not very good. You can generate content that's syntactically correct. It makes, um, it, it follows the sentence structure and things like this. So this is a paper that was uh, apparently submitted to an academic journal, or uh, maybe generated from some LaTeX, um, but there has been some that have been submitted and accepted to academic journals because the reviewers weren't um, paying enough attention to the content. So uh, it's getting better. Um, the area we talked about a little earlier was uh, recommendation systems. So uh, two different types of these. Um, if you look at users who have a similar profile to a particular user, uh, you can find things uh, that they like. Um, and this is, this is not anything particularly uh, related to machine learning. You can do this just using um, some simple statistical methods. And I guess you could call this learning, um, where it learns similar groups of users and recommends um, similar content to them. Another is uh, content-based filtering, which uh, just based on the content will recommend new types of content without looking at other users. Um, on Amazon, we see this a lot. Uh, in my country, we have uh, Amazon recommends similar items based on other people's uh, purchases. Um, and I think these areas are, are kind of interesting, uh, but uh, there's lots of benign use cases for usability um, for machine learning that will dramatically improve uh, our ability to control and interact with um, machines. Um, a lot of people have recognized that, oh, there's kind of a, a very low bandwidth uh, between our brain and uh, computers, and so we'd like to improve that somehow. Handwriting recognition, um, speech recognition, uh, these are all things that you can um, use, you can give feedback to people as they're speaking to improve their pronunciation, um, and also accessibility uh, for people who don't have all of their sensory, um, uh, all five senses that we have. Um, so, uh, in short, uh, we can use machine learning uh, to help us um, improve ourselves, uh, change our habits, um, learn new languages, uh, teach new skills, and things like that. So uh, you're here to learn a little about deep learning. Uh, deep learning is uh, uh, kind of an, an extension of traditional machine learning techniques. Um, and we're going to do our best to uh, explain some of these uh, concepts in uh, a short amount of time. Um, so we'll start from the beginning. Uh, there's a few things that um, are not too mathematically uh, involved uh, that I think um, with just a bit of high school math, you can understand. Um, one of them is uh, this idea of a tensor. You see them all the time um, in your day -day daily um, coding work. So you, you, uh, you work with tensors. Um, tensors 
come in all shapes and sizes, but uh, the smallest one is probably a scalar, a simple zero-dimensional tensor. It has um, some value, uh, a character, a number. You can encode this in it as anything you like. Um, and uh, the kind of one-dimensional abstraction is, is an array. Uh, you have um, lots of uh, a vector, maybe you might call it. Uh, it has lots of different elements, and you can index each of these by a single index um, that gives you uh, one of the elements. Uh, two dimensions, you have a, a matrix, which is um, kind of an abstraction. You have uh, lots of different numbers, and you index these with uh, two numbers. So uh, you have n dimensions, and you need n um, indices to, to index uh, one of these elements. And you can, you can get more and more abstract. Um, as, you, as you do, as you increase the number of dimensions, it uh, becomes a little more computationally difficult to work with. So uh, we prefer these to be uh, small. And small um, uh, means maybe uh, larger than you, you might think, but not you know, millions of dimensions, so probably smaller than that. Um, and uh, there's, so there's, there's lots of th different things we can do with these tensors. So um, you can encode uh, lots of different real-world information, um, real-world uh, objects uh, as tensors. So, for example, an image, you can say an image is, or an n by n image, has um, n times n pixels, and you can um, encode this as a single point in a higher dimensional space uh, that, let's say these pixels are just um, gray level values from 0 to 255, and there's no color. Then um, you, you can encode this as, as a point in, in uh, a space that's uh, n times n dimensions. And um, there's kind of interesting things you can do with that uh, once you start thinking about um, uh, higher dimensional objects like this. So, for example, um, a very uh, common uh, thing you might do um, with uh, images, you can take the, the average of these. So you can take the average of every pixel value and you'll find an average image, or an average, maybe here they took a bunch of different faces and they averaged them. And um, they took some, some faces that are smiling and some uh, that are neutral. And by apply, applying a simple uh, transformation, um, you, can, you can take a, an average face and make it a smiling face, and you can follow the path um, through, and it becomes animated. Um, so that's, it, it's, it, it's pretty neat. Uh, so you can do this with uh, words as well. Um, a, a nice uh, uh, kind of application of um, machine learning is that we sort of learned how to encode um, natural language as tensors. And this is kind of... Um, uh, not, not exactly straightforward, it's not, not obvious how we do this, but we can say that, um, for example, a first pass might be, well, you take every word in a sentence and say each word is a dimension. You have lots of different words, maybe the 10,000 words, so there's 10,000 values along that axis. And then the next word is another dimension, the next word is another dimension. But you have a sentence that's a variable length, you, how are we supposed to encode that? Um, so the idea is that you take, you look at lots of different um, uh, words in a corpus, and um, based on their context um, and the preceding and um, following words, uh, you can find words that occur um, together very frequently, and you can um, define um, mathematical operations on, on these, um, these groups of words. So uh, this is called a, a word embedding, or, um, it's, uh, or just in general a neural embedding, where you take a bunch of information and um, the, the, where, where, you, where you, you, you analyze the data set, and uh, you, you can compress this into a small amount of dimensions, maybe like a hundred dimensional space, and uh, the same, the, you can preserve the relationships um, between different words so that um, uh, conceptually, like you have a, a man and a woman, and there's, um, uh, there's a distance between them, and, and you can apply this uh, mathematical operation that takes man and woman uh, and apply it to, say, a word like king, and you'll get queen. Um, or, uh, or past tense for verbs and things like this. Um, and there's lots of different interesting uh, work that's, that looks at, at uh, extracting semantic content um, from uh, corpus uh, linguistics to, uh, to, to figure out um, like translation. So, for example, uh, if you tr train it on two different... Um, books uh, in two different languages, then you can find associations between pairs of words. Um, this is done using a technique called word to vec uh, This is another example of some uh, relationships that you can uh, kind of find between 
um, between words, uh, adjectives, nouns, um, real uh, pr proper nouns and places and things like this. Um, so uh, by using uh, tensors, we can encode lots of different things um, as high, di high dimensional data. And uh, it's important to, to uh, well, we can try to visualize these things. Uh, it's, in some cases, whenever you, you're, you're visualizing them, if it's in a higher dimensional space, then you're, you're throwing away some information. Um, but uh, the best thing to do uh, is, to, uh, is to just uh, use these techniques and, and, uh, and remember the, the rules for, for working with them. So, um, uh, it's difficult to visualize. We, we'll show you some methods you can use to visualize them, um, but uh, we'll leave it at that for now. So, um, in general, there are kind of three different types of machine learning that we've, uh, we've explored. And um, it, it's, it's helpful to think about these um, in terms of classification, prediction, and, and other things. But in general, we have supervised learning, which is where you have some data and some labels for each of the items in your data set. And um, uh, you train, them, you train the, the machine to learn the label for an unlabeled item. You have something new that you, that's not in your data set, and you want to predict the label. Or, um, for example, you might want to, um, if it's, this is if it's uh, cl classification. Um, uh, there's, there's other applications for prediction, uh, for, for real, learning real valued numbers and things like this. Um, unsupervised learning is uh, an area where we kind of starting to understand, but it's, uh, it's a little more uh, abstract. So you, as a child, you learn lots of different objects. You're, you're receiving all kinds of information about the world. You have dogs and cats. And um, no one, maybe, maybe someone tells you, but uh, let's assume that you don't know what the word for this is. Uh, but you start to recognize similar things, and you can kind of group them together. Um, in general, you can think of unsupervised learning as clustering, but there's lots of different methods um, so that uh, you can extract patterns from unlabeled data. Uh, reinforcement learning is where we um, interact with some system. We don't know. It's like a black box with some buttons on it. And um, each button has a reward, and that reward may change over time, and it have, may have some kind of complex dynamics. But we're trying to find out well, what's the operation, uh, what's, what's the, the best sequence of, uh, of buttons to press so that we get the maximum reward over time? Um, so we'll, we'll focus in uh, a little bit on supervised learning, because this is uh, usually where, where we start. Um, there's two, two types of supervised learning. Uh, there's regression, uh, where um, you're trying to fit some line or some plane to, um, to some, some data. So, um, you have uh, perhaps like uh, the, the linear regression is perhaps the simplest the simplest one. So we'll go through that example, and that's where um, you you want to fit a line that uh, minimizes the, um, the 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 error for um, any given point. So that the idea is these points are being generated some, by some natural process, and you're trying to figure out what's the uh, the process that generated these points. Uh, the second class of supervised learning is usually thought of as classification, um, this idea that you're trying to separate the data uh, as best as possible so that um, you get the correct um, prediction uh, very often. Um, so let's take a quick look at, at supervised learning uh, and see if we can um, understand what it's, what it's doing. So with classification, uh, you have uh, different classes of objects. And this can be, uh, uh, the, for example, we'll take a look at a binary classification task. This is where we have two classes, um, a dog uh, and a cat, and we'd like to try to learn uh, what the, the correct classification is for um, a new animal based on these two parameters, size and domestic domesticity. Uh, so uh, these can represent anything you want, uh, but um, they're just, we have two uh, parameters and we want to learn what the correct label is. Um, and we want to draw a line that kind of separates them uh, as cleanly as possible. So as we receive more data, we kind of update the, the line so that it separates this data. And the more items we receive, we train on, hopefully the better our approximation will be of the line that separates it most cleanly. And um, we'll use uh, uh, two different numbers. So we'll use one to represent uh, dogs and zero to represent cats. It's true and false. Uh, you can uh, have more classes, but for binary classification, it's pretty simple. So if you remember back to uh, your 
elementary school days, you might have um, an equation for a line. Um, and that equation has uh, two different uh, things that control the slope of line and the offset from the origin. So you have um, uh, this equation, uh, y uh, equals mx plus b. And um, what we're trying to do is trying to learn m and b in this example. Um, and we can generalize this to more dimensions, but for example, in three dimensions, we might have to learn three different uh, parameters uh, that represent a uh, plane. The, the, and this is the, the separation in three dimensions. Um, but in general, we have to learn some, some parameters that uh, we don't know. And initially, they'll be random or zero, and we'll try to figure out what these are. And luckily for us, with this task, uh, no matter where you initialize, or which values you initialize these parameters to be, uh, these, these weights, um, then you'll always end up with uh, an optimal solution. So it's guaranteed uh, to converge. We'll take a look at a cool algorithm for doing that. Um, so initially, uh, when you want to uh, classify some data, this is, this is this, we, we have some, a new data point that's unlabeled and our existing weights. And let's say we know what these are already. So we're going to generate a prediction, a guess, for what uh, this data point is, the, what label it's going to be. And in order to do that, we're going to take each parameter in our data, uh, for each item in the data, uh, and we're going to uh, multiply it by a weight in our, our set of weights. Um, and this is in Python, uh, but if, you're, if, you're, if it looks unfamiliar, what we're doing here is just we're adding a single element um, to this list, which will always be one. Uh, this is called a bias. Uh, and then we're, taking, we're concatenating, concatenating that with our, each, of, each, of our, each parameter in our data. And uh, we're zipping that up with the weights and just multiplying them together to get our prediction. Right? And then if that prediction is less than zero, we're going to say it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a cat. And if it's greater than zero, we're going to say it's a dog. Or it's, it's, it's a simple step function. So um, if, if it's less than zero, we're going to output zero. If it's greater than zero, we're going to output one. And visually, this is what this looks like. So uh, we're just taking the, each of the input values in, in each data item, um, multiplying it by a weight, uh, passing it, it through this, this transfer function. We're going to add them all up. And if it's greater than some threshold, we're going to say it's one class. And if it's less than it, then we're going to say it's another class. Um, this is called the activation function. Um, and this can, this can be. Uh, different things, but um, usually uh, for, for binary classification, it's helpful to uh, just have a, a step function where it, it's, it, it's um, not continuous, so it just jumps up. But for other tasks, this may be a continuous, a smooth function. Um, so uh, what we do uh, is, this is for classification, right? And so this will give us a dog or cat. But how do we get these weights? We don't know what they are. Um, how do we learn what they are? So when we're training, uh, we have a bunch of labeled data, right? And this data consists of uh, some, so, so a bunch of data items and a label. Right? Uh, and what we're going to do is, to make things easier, for each of the features, we're just going to add one. Remember, this is the, the bias parameter. This is the offset from the origin. This, just, this is always just going to learn a single value. There's no um, uh, interaction with any of the other parameters. Uh, so here we have uh, three elements in our vector, and um, we're, we're going to initialize these to be either zero or random. It really doesn't matter how we do this for, uh, for linear regression, uh, for, uh, for, for this type of task. This is, um, uh, what we're going to try to do is minimize this error. Um, so as long as the total error is greater than uh, some threshold, then we're going to continue to iterate through our data. And then for each item in the data set, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate an error. Um, this is also called a loss function. Um, and this is so simply the difference here um, uh, between what, we, what the actual thing is and what our guess was. Um, so the label might be 1, uh, and the guess is 0, in which case the error is 1. Um, or the label might be 0, and the guess might be 1, in which case the error will be negative 1. And um, what, this, what this does is it's going to, just going to control um, the, 
uh, the direction, right? Uh, so for each of these weights, uh, and remember this includes the one bias, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the existing weight, the current weight, and we're going to add the, the rate, which is just a small number. This, you want this to be pretty small because we're going to do this many, many times and we want it to kind of slowly approximate um, the, the optimum. We're going to multiply that by the error that we receive. So remember, this is just a sign value. This is positive or negative. Uh, and then we're going to multiply this by the parameter value. Uh, so for each of, these, each of these parameters we're learning, and this is domesticity and size, remember, um, for our data. Uh, and this, remember, the, the, the zip thing just takes the two arrays and zips them together. So two to one chain dimensional arrays, and they're the same length, so they're just going to put them together, and you're going to get a, um, a, a, a two by however uh, long it is, so two by three. Um, and then uh, our total error, we're going to update that each time we do this. And so for each item in the data set, this will update our slope and update our bias just a little bit in the right direction. Um, and so. Uh, for each data item, we, we do this, we pass the error back, we update the weights, and slowly, um, the, the hope is that this will approximate uh, a line that separates the data as best as possible. Um, and it looks something like this. So you start off anywhere, in somewhere inside the space, and you're you know, slowly but surely updating the slope and uh, the offset of this line so that um, it, it reduces the error uh, for, your, for each item in the data set. And this is an approximation of um, what it looks like. So um, this algorithm uh, was known for some time. This is, uh, this is used to classify things that are linearly separable. So if it's linearly separable, if your data set is linearly separable, then uh, that means if you can draw a line through it and separate two different classes, or however many classes, uh, then, um, then it's guaranteed to converge on the optimum solution. Uh, this is known as, the problem is, is, is convex. Uh, so there's not uh, lots of different solutions that it could converge on. Uh, there's, there's just one, and they all, the error always points towards that. Um, however, that's if it's linearly separable. Um, and this is known for some time, but uh, this, this kind of uh, question of how do you separate data that's not linearly separable uh, maybe it starts to um, flip-flop, so it, it, can, it tries to appro approach a point and it can't make a decision. Uh, so this is kind of a classic um, way this breaks down. This is called uh, the, the XOR um, problem with, with perceptrons. Um, and uh, when they invented this technique, um, Marvin Minsky and uh, some of his colleagues, they, they, they looked at this and they said, oh, well, um, uh, it's probably broken, so we won't pursue neural networks for." for and we'll go into doing something, something else called expert systems. And so this sort of stagnated a lot of the progress they made in neural nets. Um, but uh, some people knew uh, about how to fix this. And, um, and for many years, uh, they thought about how to do this well. But it, the gen generalization is that you take a bunch of these perceptrons. These, um, they're, they're called, uh, also called logistic regression. It's, it's not a regression problem, but it's just what they call it. And uh, they stack them together. So you have some input elements. So each of these um, represents uh, a, a particular input, and um, you have di different weights. And you're going to connect these to two different perceptrons, um, or however many you have. And then you're going to stack them. So this is, called, this is the, the input layer. Uh, the hidden layer is which in between, and then the output layer. And, uh, and the question is, well, um, how, wh where does this get us? Wh what does this, this, um, this improvement add? And so with something like this, uh, you can uh, separate data that uh, lo looks like the XOR function. So you can um, create a boundary that, that, um, that has two different lines. Um, and uh, in general, if you stack them, uh, more of them up, then you can approximate arbitrary functions in arbitrary dimensions. So um, if you have enough and you have infinite computational power, then uh, you can just start stacking them up and they'll learn uh, the boundary between um, a really uh, complex function, a really complex um, uh, function that's generated by some, some data. And so maybe this has uh, you know, lots of subtle um, points where, where, where you want to find the boundary um, between, say, a dog and a cat. And uh, they may look pretty similar in some cases, uh, but if you train it well, and uh, it, it, will, 
You will learn the distinction between these two things. Um, but the question you might have is, well, how do you get it to learn uh, the, uh, the weights? Um, because each of the weights in each of these layers depends on the previous set of weights. And uh, we don't uh, have a whole lot of time to go into exactly how this is done, but it figured out how to do this. Uh, and this is uh, a really cool technique uh, that uses uh, some calculus, uh, and it follows um, uh, this, this pattern. So as you're training, you're going to, um, as we did before, we're going to initialize all the weights randomly, or to be zero, and we're going to, um, for each item in the data set, we're going to uh, compute the error and then update our prediction. And uh, we can compute the error for each of the layers, and we're going to backpropagate it. But it's not exactly um, important how this is done. There's a lot of subtle details. But the visualization is that um, you're minimizing this loss function. It's in many dimensions. And you're trying to find where the minimum is. And when you're doing this, you're slowly updating this in small steps. Um, and you can think of it as rolling a ball down a hill. Um, it's called gradient descent. There's lots of different algorithms for gradient descent, but this is basically what it does. And so, well, what's deep learning? Deep learning is you take a bunch of these things, you uh, make them really uh, wide, and usually they're wider than they are deep. Um, but uh, say, for example, if you have an image that has um, lots of uh, different pixels in the image, then you have uh, maybe hundreds of different inputs, and you connect them to each of these perceptrons or these neurons inside of uh, the network and um, compute an activation function, uh, pass the, act the output into a bunch of other ones, and this is, um, this is deep learning. So, uh, well, the, the question is, well, how many layers do you need and how wide does it need to be? Uh, and the answer to, well, how many layers do you need is uh, you, you just keep adding more layers until uh, your test error doesn't improve anymore. Uh, this is not a very good answer, but this is, as far as we can tell, there's, um, there's a lot of trial and error in this process. Um, so uh, the number of layers it has, uh, the exact structure of each of the layers, um, these are determined by parameters known as hyperparameters, which we can also learn through deep learning. Um, so it's getting a little better, but very often when you're designing these networks, they're going to be a little tricky to fine tune. Um, so uh, the progress really started to accelerate um, in 2011, 20, 2012, um, when they had good data sets. Uh, so this ImageNet data set uh, was, uh, was generated by some, uh, some people who were studying neural networks. Um, it comprises of lots of different uh, images, and um, uh, you, you can use the, the bunch of different labels that people have tagged these images with that are continuing to be improved whenever you um, uh, for example, uh, in some data sets, whenever you do captures, then it'll improve these. Um, but uh, the idea is that uh, the machine is trying to learn a label that's inside um, one of the labels that the humans generated for the image. And um, originally, it's, it's, it started with uh, something like this, a small image, and you're, you're trying to um, predict like a 28 by 28 pixel image, uh, what the correct label should be. Um, and how do we do that? Well, uh, it uses something uh, called convolutional neural nets. And this is, it sounds very complicated, but it's a pretty simple idea. Uh, and we knew about this for, for some time, how to do um, image processing. Uh, and this is a technique that is used a lot for detecting edges and doing um, blurs and filters on like a, uh, an app, like uh, Instagram, for example. So you want to put a filter on an app. You can do something like a Gaussian filter, which will blur the image, the edges of the image. Uh, and it, it, what it does is it just takes a small kernel. A kernel is just a matrix, and it passes it across the image. Um, and it multiplies each of the pixels beneath the kernel inside that image, and adds them up, or does some operation to it, and then puts that into the new image. Um, we pad it so that it can get every single pixel. Um, and so it looks something like this. So you have, uh, say, a black and white image. And what you're going to do is you learn uh, this kernel. So um, what, what this does is it kind of slides the kernel over the image. And you're learning uh, this, this convolved feature. Um, so this is a convolution. It's, uh, it, it's a sort of a standard image processing technique. And they've learned uh, through hard work and error. You know, people, researchers have learned how to design these things to uh, detect edges, for example. So this is um, one application of it. Um, and this is using uh, just a, 
a three by three matrix. Um, it's, it's a Kenny edge detector, and uh, it will identify um, where the edges are in an image based on um, the uh, how quickly the the, the colors change. So uh, you can use this for lots of different things. But what we're doing is we're learning uh, what these kernels are, and when you're when you're stacking these layer on top of each on top of layer, then um, you're convolving each of these features in, sm in small bits. So you're learning increasingly abstract uh, representations for the image. Another thing we do to improve the performance of this um, is, is, some, is a technique called downsampling. So there's a lot of low-level image data that we don't need, we can throw away. And this is done using uh, pooling, um, which just takes the maximum value of each of uh, the image uh, pixels, and it, it downsamples it. So in the lowest level, you're learning things like edges and uh, corners and things like this, and you're abstracting this um, to become more and more complex. So you have circles and shapes. Um, and the idea is that uh, as you get higher and higher, you're learning increasingly abstract concepts. Um, and so, for example, if you look at which images or which parts of the image are being activated most strongly, uh, you can see it'll, it'll learn things like textures and eyes and things like this for animals. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is a pretty common technique used in image processing. Um, so we mentioned before that these things are fully connected, uh, or they're, each one is connected to every, single thing, every other thing. But it turns out we don't need all of that. So computing all of those weights and updating them takes a lot of, uh, a lot of energy and time. So what we're going to do is just drop some of these out. And these, these are just using these techniques, they got very, very good, so they increased uh, the, the the error on uh, this image net down to um, like 10% uh, early on. And this was a dramatic improvement. So they started realizing, oh, this, this actually works. Um, so this is a convolutional net. And you have a lot of these uh, layers. There, there's some, some layers that are um, taking the original image and just transposing it with a, a simple convolution. Then you're downsampling, um, doing more convolutions. And then uh, at the end, you might have some layers that do um, uh, drop out, which is it just deletes some of the, the connections. Um, and so using this, this technique, uh, you can do deep learning on, um, on, on images. Um, and it turns out you don't need to learn the whole thing. So you can take a pre-trained model uh, that's available, just download it, and, um, and it's already learned the textures and things like this. And what you can do uh, is chop off some layers. So this is the Google Inception model. This is available to download. And, um, you might you know, want to recognize um, cars and trucks. And so you chop off the last layer and then train it on your own data using the lower level texture data. So this is, this is called transfer learning. Um, but uh, there's a nice library that I've been using uh, called Deep Learning for J. Uh, that I think you should check out. Um, it's available uh, if you're doing things on Spark, and it's useful for doing that. Uh, you have large data sets, and you're trying to learn um, some, some patterns from them. So. Um, it runs uh, GPU, uh, and uh, it runs in lots of different environments. It's Java. And it looks something like this. Uh, so when you're configuring the network, this is before you do any training or anything like this, you set up the structure of the network. Uh, and this is done using a builder pattern. And uh, what you can do is you can also configure this in JSON. But this is simple enough to, to look at. So um, you have the network configuration. Uh, you set up um, uh, which, which algorithm it's using for gradient descent. A uh, certain amount of iterations, um, a learning rate, which is a small number. You want it to be small. If it's too large, it'll kind of uh, jump over uh, some small, some minimums. So um, very often, you want to when you initialize this to a number, it'll become deterministic. So uh, you'll get the same result each time. This will determine like the initial starting points and some of the random numbers that it learns uh, that it's using. Um, and there's other parameters uh, for for gradient descent that you'll pass in. Um, you'll set up the layers uh, like this. So maybe there's just two layers here. Um, you're learning a 28 by 28 uh, pixel image. So this might be something um, from uh, just a black and white image. And, um, and there's another layer here. Uh, we output this. And then the, the final layer is just um, an encoding of classes. So uh, if you want to learn two classes, it might just be an array of two, uh, array of two elements. And uh, these will either be 0 or 1, or some confidence um, between 0 and 1. Um, and and this, is, this is called uh, one-hot encoding. So um, in the, in, when you're initializing the model, uh, you just initialize it. And then when you're training it, 
uh, you, you initialize the configuration, it'll serialize this on memory, and then um, we, you'll, you'll train it like this. So for each item in the data, the data set, you'll have an iterator. You might batch these up into, um, into sizes that are uh, maybe like 50 or 100, something like this. And uh, you'll train it many, many, many times. And you want to um, do this for maybe um, days or maybe weeks if you're doing um, uh, image recognition. Um, and the, th the final result is that uh, you'll, you'll evaluate it and you'll, you'll see which of the false positives, false, false negatives, true positives, and true negatives. Uh, and it'll give you scores for each of these. It has a nice UI for doing that, uh, so you can track this in your browser, um, how it's doing. And um, I thought I'd just give you a quick example uh, of how a pre-trained model might look, might work, just so you can see it. Um, so you have here uh, some different models that I've trained, and this is all available on this repository. I'll make it available after the session. Uh, so we have um, some pre-trained stuff that I'll show you. And here I have, uh, I don't know if you can see, oh, you can't see that, can you? Um, so I, I've pre-trained this, this model using a bunch of different, uh, different networks, and we'll see how it performs um, on uh, recognizing this digit here, uh, which is a three. But you, I can, I'll change that as well. So it's loading uh, this pre-trained model that's saved on disk. Um, you can inspect the weights and everything like this that it's learned. Um, and uh, the output will give you some scores and a confidence for each one. So here, um, they all recognize as a three, because it's a pretty clear three. Uh, I wrote that pretty clearly. I guess um, my handwriting was good when I wrote it. But if we change this uh, to uh, something else, um, a different number, Um, normally, I'd get someone from the audience, but we're running a little low on time, so uh, I'll try uh, a different number. Someone um, uh, thought they were being clever, and uh, they tried a zero and then put a line through it. And this is used, uh, this, one, of, one of these is used to recognize all of the mail that's sorted in the United States. So um, uh, we trained the same one. Uh, I did it on my la uh, laptop. It took uh, a couple hours. Uh, since these are small images, they're just 28 by 28. And we'll run this one more time. Uh, this data set, by the way, is available on pretty much uh, any framework that you use. It's called MNIST. Um, it's, it's used for categorizing checks and things like that that you write to another person. Um, but uh, it'll recognize digits pretty well. So each of the outputs uh, is in the format of uh, this one hot encoding um, from 0 uh, to 9. And if it's 0, it's pretty low confidence uh, that it's 0. Um, each of these is different networks. So one is the state of the art. The top one is the state of the art. The second one is a one layer um, MLP, uh, multi layer perceptron. And the third one is a two layer one. Um, so it looks like here we've, um, we've confused, okay, we've confused all of them. So it looks like uh, uh, this was a good example. Uh, so they all think it's an, an eight pretty well. So um, uh, that's just a, a quick example of what you can do um, uh, using this framework. Uh, all of the code is available um, on the repository if you'd like to check it out. Uh, and if you have any questions, I guess there's time for maybe one question. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, how well uh, does Java, is, how well is Java fit for applications like that? Uh, with, uh, in relation for, mm -hmm. in relation with, for example, TPU acceleration and so mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so this particular one is, uh, oh, so the question was, uh, how, how well does Java uh, fit for GPUs? Uh, how well can you, you train it uh, in comparison to other languages, correct? Um, so there's, there's frameworks for pretty much every language uh, now. 
Um, there, for Python, uh, probably the most popular one is, is TensorFlow. Uh, for Java, I think this is, there's not much competition. This is the only one I've really found. Uh, maybe there's some other ones. Um, but uh, it does interface with the GPU. So um, it does basic linear algebra, accelerates these things. So if you have a GPU, it'll work much more quickly. Um, and uh, it runs uh, on, on the cloud as well. So you can put this up on AWS and get it to train more quickly. Um, but uh, I think this works very well for images right now. For other things like um, learning uh, speech recognition and sequence to sequence models, um, then uh, it may not be as uh, up to the date as state of the art, but it does continue to implement. Um, it's active. The community is pretty good. It implements state of the art uh, algorithms from research papers. So that um, is uh, the long and short of it. I'm Brendan Considine, and thank you all for coming to this session on deep learning. I hope you learned something. Um, <laughs>